What's going on, guys? My name is Steve. Thank you for stopping by my channel. Today, we're going to be reacting to six ways British and American driving is very different. I've only seen one other video that was specifically about driving in the UK, and that video was mainly talking about the reasons why British people drive on the left. Other than the fact that you guys drive on the left in the UK and we drive on the right in America, I really can't think of any other differences there are when it comes to driving in America versus the UK. Uh, but obviously there are differences, and so that's why I'm checking out this video today. You know, I, I know that this man is originally from England, and he's lived in America for quite a while, so I'm guessing he probably knows what he's talking about when it comes to what are some of the main differences when it comes to driving between the two countries. So anyways, guys, I don't really know what to expect here other than the fact I know that driving on the left versus the right has got to be on here. But other than that, I really don't know what this list is going to have on it. So anyways, guys, let's go ahead and find out what are some of the differences between driving in the UK versus driving in America. It's if you've ever seen those country roads in the United Kingdom, I think half of American cars wouldn't be able to fit. They'd have to cut through the fields and potentially kill hundreds of cows, you know, bringing it back to South Dakota. You know, it's interesting he says that because when I think back to any time I've seen people driving in the UK countryside or even the Irish countryside, um, m granted, this has mostly been in movies, but still, um, it's almost always on a very narrow country road, like to the point that you basically have to pull over if someone's coming from the other direction so that you can pass each other. Um, is that really a thing? Is that what the majority of the roads in the country look like? in the UK, like if you get out of the cities, are they pretty much for the most part, extremely narrow? Um, you know, I think for some reason, there is a stereotype uh, that exists in the US that we have very wide roads. I don't know where I've heard that stereotype, but for some reason, that's a stereotype that I feel like I've heard from somewhere. And I actually think that stereotype might be true because, you know, I've lived in a number of states and I've been in plenty areas throughout this country and a lot of rural areas, a lot of places out in the middle of nowhere. And I can tell you, generally speaking, I can't think of any roads that were so narrow that you would have to pull over to get people to pass. You know, they, I mean, there's almost always room for at least two cars on a road. And in a lot of cases, many more cars, especially if you go on to, you know, high, bigger highways and whatnot. But, um, you know, that's interesting. I wonder if that is a thing, if that is a major difference. Are the roads just much more narrow in the UK than they are in America? Um, you know, now that I think about it from what I've seen in movies and whatnot, I believe that may be the case. I believe he may be onto something there. Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to driving. I think it's a well-known fact that driving etiquette and just driving practices in general are different on either side of the pond, but how are they different? Having lived in the United States now for 11 years, I'm here to tell you, even though I don't drive. From the driving test right through to the cars themselves and, you know, the side of the road that we drive on. As Dude, I literally can't imagine. Okay, well, I'll take this back. Maybe if you live in the, in a bigger city where there's good public transportation, you can get away with not driving. But I've lived here all my life, other than when I was overseas in Asia for a while. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I've lived here my entire life, and I can say that I've lived in a number of different states, a number of different areas, and there's never been a time where I could have got around without driving. I literally couldn't have done it. There was, there's been no uh, public transportation uh, good enough that I could have relied on. Um, and so I find it interesting how someone could live here for 11 years and, and not drive unless you go to one of these bigger cities. And maybe that's, maybe that's the case. Maybe he lives in one of these bigger cities uh, that have good public transportation. Although now, I will say, even some small areas, I guess you could possibly depend on Uber or whatnot. Um, but, man, it would just man, it'd be pretty difficult here in America. I know the, the public transportation, that is definitely a difference. The public transportation is so much better in the UK. I mean, I know that's a stereotype that America has, that they have bad public transportation. And uh, for the most part, that is an accurate, uh, accurate stereotype. Uh, except if you go to certain bigger areas, you could probably do pretty well with public transportation. If you go to New York City or, you know, probably L.A., maybe uh, Chicago, I'm sure, maybe Boston. You know, the bigger cities, I'm sure you can get it by without really having a, a car. But 
It'd be hard in the majority of this country. It really would be. As well as the words that we use to describe car things, it just goes to show that Britain and America are two nations divided by a common median. We call it a trunk and you guys call it a boot, Now, before we get underway, you may be thinking, why should I take any information on this matter from somebody who doesn't drive? Well, the the truth of the matter is, I did try to learn to drive, actually, here in the United States, so I have experience of that. Um, I have no experience back in England. But I've seen cars, nearly got killed by one once. I was on my bike. You didn't need to know that. And so, without further ado, let's take a look at six ways that Britain and America's car culture is very, very different. Well, I think it's, I think, you know, I mean, you can learn a lot just being around people in a specific country. I feel like if I was to, for example, if I was to live in the UK for 11 years, even if I didn't drive, during that time, people I knew and I just seeing different things and experiencing different things, I would learn a lot about driving. So I, I can see what he's saying. I mean, he might not know everything, but you know, I'm sure I can learn a thing or two from this video. And that's the point. I don't need to learn crazy amounts of things from a video. I need to learn, if I learn one or two things from a video, I feel like that video was success, success, you know, because I like to watch a lot of different videos on the same subject. So I'm sure I'll watch a number of different videos as time goes on about different things when it comes to uh, driving in the UK. Okay, so before we get into the good stuff, a little bit about how people acquire their licenses in both countries. In the United Kingdom, where I'm from, you can get a full license at the age of 17, but until then, as soon as you apply for one, you have to have a provisional license until you pass your driving test. These provisional licenses can be acquired from the age of 15 years and oh. nine months, very specific. 15, Whereas months. in the United States, hmm. this actually varies from state to state. Right, yeah. And they don't really call that pre-license a provisional license, but a restricted driver's license and notice of course the difference between driving license and driver's license and the uh. spelling of license now like i said it does differ from state to Wait. state in south dakota hold on, for hold on, example hold on. from state to state in oh you guys spell it different let me see wow that's interesting okay i think it's interesting how he you can't get your full license to your 17 here you can uh, at least in my experience, uh, you know, it does differ a little bit state to state. But in my experience, you basically get your permit, which may be what you would consider provisional license at, you know, as soon as you turn 15 years old, you can do that. And uh, as soon as you turn 16, you can get your full license. Uh, the permit that lasts a year, 15 to 16, is basically you can drive with a licensed adult. And, in, and then, um, you know, 16, basically... Most states, at least in my experience, I'm sure there's some that change a little bit, but, uh, you know, 16, you just, you get your license, you're good to go. You can just drive by yourself uh, wherever you want or whatever. Spelling of license. Now, like I said, it does differ from state to state. In South Dakota, for example, you can acquire one of these restricted licenses from the age of 14 years and three months. Hmm, And that's issued by a department called the South Dakota Department of Public Safety. But, you know, (laughs) to be fair, South Dakota is one of the five least densely populated states in the nation. So it's it's the cows that I worry for. Now, that's kind of an extreme example. And in any case, when we're talking about passing your driver's test and getting your full unrestricted license, that will happen anywhere from the age of 16 to 18 depending on the state. Now in Britain a driving test consists of three sections. You've got your theory exam, your hazard perception exam, and then your supervised driving exam. Now wait, hold on. Theory exam. Okay, so that's your you're taking a um I mean it's like a uh paper test basically or you know probably on computer but still like you're you're taking a test to show that you know the the rules of the road or whatever. And I know what the third one is. Hold on, let me see what he said. Hold on, let's see what he... Hazard perception exam. Hazard perception exam. Okay. And then your supervised driving exam. Okay, so the paper test, all right, or, you know, the test, the knowledge test is what we would probably call that. You call it a theory test, right? Uh, so this would be our knowledge test. We have something similar to that, obviously. And then a, uh, you know, a supervised driving thing. This right here, I have no idea. Hazard, what do you call that? Hazard exam. And then you'll...
You've got your theory exam, theory exam. your hazard perception exam, yeah. and then your supervised driving exam. Now, now in the United was... States, or at least Indiana, where I took lessons, I was taught by a combination of my wife and my grandfather-in-law, who to this very day remain among the bravest people I've ever known. But to even get to the point of taking those driving lessons, I had to take a written test, which was easy. I didn't even revise for it. It was, it was mostly common sense stuff. Right. And I had to have an eye test as well, just to make sure yeah. that I could see eye test. things. And once I passed the written test and the eye test with flying colours, hazel mainly, I was then given a learner's permit, or, or was it a restricted licence? I'm confused about that. But something was given to me, and I was able to drive around oh, no. parking lots for a bit. Never passed the test, and now that I live in Chicago, don't really need to. Oh, but I've okay. been in the passenger seat on many an occasion, including one where we crashed. Probably didn't help that I never took driving lessons in the UK. But even if I had, I might have been even more confused, particularly because of the next difference. All right, before we move on, like, what is... Okay, so I understand the knowledge test. That makes... Or what you call the theory test. Uh, I mean, we have the same thing. It's, the questions are obviously going to be different and stuff, but it's the same concept. And the third one, you've got someone supervising you as you drive around and making sure that you, you know, know how to signal and, you know, basically know how to drive. That makes sense. But the third, the, the middle one, the hazard, whatever that was called, that's the one I don't really understand. Like, because the hazard thing, I mean, like, is that on a computer or something? Because otherwise, I feel like that would just be part of the of the supervised driving thing. I mean, I don't really, I, I don't really understand what that is. Cause we have nothing like, we don't have a separate thing like that. We're just, we take the paper or the, the knowledge test and then we go out and we drive, you know, with some, a supervised person. And, and if you pass your, you got your license. It's uh, so I'm not really sure what that middle one is. Please, if someone could in the comments, please let me know what the hazard whatever that is, because I, I have no clue what that could mean, because I feel like it'd be something you would just do when you're, you know, driving around with someone. But anyways, let's continue. Right and left. I think it goes without saying, mostly because most people are aware of this, that Britain and America definitely drive on different sides of the road. Indeed, you know, I've heard British people say, why do Americans drive on the wrong side of the road? But I don't think the burden of accountability lies with Americans. Indeed, like the United States, the majority of the planets, not including oceans, drive on the right. Because of this, of course, America has the steering wheel on the left, Britain has kept theirs on the right. But this was not always the case, at least in terms of American cars and American roads. Before the 1908 launch of the Ford Motor Company's Model T, virtually every car in America placed the steering wheel on the right. In fact, you know, Ford only made that change to make it easier for people entering on the passenger side to avoid oncoming traffic. Traffic. Until this though, long after a law was passed in 1792 mandating that vehicles, horse buggies and the like, must travel along the right side of the road, it was widely accepted that steering should take place on the right. Evidence of this can still be found today, in fact, in Amish communities where horse buggies mm. are sometimes steered in this manner. When mass production of American cars began in the late 19th century, it was widely viewed that right-hand steering was the preferred method, since, you know, it had evidently worked out just fine for the journeyman of yesteryear. However, by the turn of the century, motor companies began looking for innovative new ways to sell their latest product. Cadillac introduced the first lever-operated headlights, while the Marmon Motor Company is believed to have pioneered the use of a rear-view mirror in 1911, and so it was that Ford introduced left-hand steering in 1908. And because it was later seen that left-hand steering was conducive to safer driving since it was easier for the driver to judge his or her proximity to oncoming traffic, this new way of steering became virtually standardized by the mid-1910s and has remained thus to this very day. But there is one United States territory that has bucked the trend, and that's the United States Virgin Islands. Mm. There, they drive on the left, despite the fact that the steering wheels are also on the left. It must be chaos. Who knows? I've not tried it, but maybe one day. Now, whether That would be interesting now that I think about it. No, I watched a video uh, about why British people drive on the left, and... Uh, I found it really interesting. Um, and in the comments, I noticed a lot of people were like, they couldn't, because they drive stick, they couldn't imagine because the dominant hand on most people is the right. And so they can't, could imagine doing the stick with the right. As someone who's drove a stick, I couldn't imagine doing the, uh, doing the stick with my left hand. I would want, I would want the, uh, always do the stick with my right hand. I would obviously get used to it if I had to, but 
I think you just get used to, you know, what you were taught on. You know what I mean? So, like, um, we just can't really easily imagine, you know, changing sides, so to speak, uh, when it comes to how we use things. I am, I am so uncoordinated with my left hand, my left arm, that I feel like I would not do very good with trying to uh, do a stick shift with my left. Uh, I would always uh, feel more comfortable doing it in my right and driving with my uh, left, um, my left uh, arm. I, I generally speaking, I think I do tend to. I have I have an automatic uh, at this point, but I think I generally usually if I have one hand on the wheel, it's usually probably my left. Uh, I usually just kind of have my uh, right kind of on my stick. Sh well, I don't have a on my uh, shifter or whatever. Um, but just interesting how we get used to uh, you know the the direction or the side we, we you know we use our hands and stuff on. Whether you drive on the right or the left, there's no disputing which country has the most cars. When it comes to car ownership, Britain cannot hold a candle to the United States. And that probably makes sense for reasons that I've outlined before. We have a fairly well-connected rail system across the entire country. That's something that the United States does not really boast. And in Britain, most towns and cities do have a fairly comprehensive bus system. So you don't always have to drive to work, for example, or to your kid's sports day. You know, if you take the bus, you've got an excuse if you're late. America is a wide open country, not everywhere has great public transportation, and add to that the popularity around cars is just a big part of American culture, certainly yes. has been since the 20th That's century. True. And so these reasons perhaps account for why there are only 471 cars in Britain for every 1,000 people. Wow. That's crazy, man. Compa I mean, you know, I understand it because the public transportation is just so much... Uh, so much better and kind of things are just more, uh, you know, close together, I think, uh, than they are in America. Obviously, America is so much more spread out and just bigger. Uh, and obviously, like you said, the car culture probably is uh, quite a bit bigger here than over there. But 471 per every thousand, that's crazy. I would have thought it would have been quite a bit higher than that. I'm guessing that it wouldn't surprise me if in America we had over a thousand per thousand, but I don't, I don't really know what to expect with that people. I say only, that probably sounds like a lot, but that, that number includes children in the population. So if you just eradicate children, not literally, just in this scenario, <laughs> then, you know, that number is going to be quite a lot higher, but it probably still wouldn't reach America's number of cars per person, even if you include American children in this, some of whom, of course, South Dakota knows all about that. Because in the United States, there are 838 cars for every 1,000 people. Now, now certain states in America do have a proportionate True. stranglehold on this very stat take now i'll say that um right now we only have one car because like I, we don't really need to really right now we've we've had two in the past but at this point we just haven't needed it it's just like why if you don't need two cars why would you have a lot of people i know people i do i know people that have four five cars you know because they'll have like They'll have like a beat up old truck to kind of haul stuff around their property and stuff like that. They'll have a, they'll have a, you know, a van. They'll have a couple cars for each person, each adult there. And, uh, you know, just things like that. Sometimes maybe someone will have a car that they, that they cherish that like an old Corvette or something like that. But, uh. As a whole, I can definitely, I definitely already knew that was going to be the case, uh, that we definitely probably have more cars here. But I'm thankful to only have one. The only bad part is when you only have one car and something happens to it and it needs to get fixed, you know, you, you got to figure something out and go get a rental car, which can get expensive and stuff. But, uh, you know, it definitely saves on insurance and things like that, and wear and tear and all that. So, anyway. For example, the state of Wyoming. There are more cars per capita in that state than any other state in the nation. There are, in fact, 1,100 cars for every 1,000 people. It is one of seven states in the Union where cars outnumber people. And then there's car production as well. The United States is the second highest producer of automobiles in the entire world behind China, and it's certainly way ahead of Britain. And so much for the number of cars. What about the amount of miles we're actually driving? Well, the United States absolutely kicks Britain's <laughs> ass on that one. Yeah. A 2010 study found that British people... 
Okay, hold on, we'll see this list. On average, drive about 6,500 miles a year. Wow. Wow, that's like, uh, what is that, about mm, uh, 5,500 miles a month? I mean, 550 miles a month? Is that what that is? Oh, uh, man. I, it's about that, something like that, 550 miles a month or some roughly, give or take a little bit. Wow. Um, I just got my insurance back. I mean, I just got my insurance back. I just got my insurance, uh, my car insurance, uh, renew, uh, renewed, autom automatic renewal every six months. And they were basically, they always ask you how many miles you drive on average per, per year or whatever. And in the, in my state, uh, the average was 13,500. So we're talking, I mean, we're literally talking more than double. Uh, which, well. if you do the mathematics on that, that's about 18 miles a day, which, that I mean, that sounds like a lot to me. But that's nothing compared to the United States because Americans, on average, are doing twice that amount each year. The average American drives about 13,000 miles a year, which is about 36 miles a day. That sounds like hell. And I know that it is because I used to drive from Anderson to Indianapolis and back. You're talking there about 40 miles, so that was about 80 miles a day I used to do. That was that was routine. I knew a lot of people that were doing that. And that's, that's not the only commute route of course of that size in the United States and yet again these numbers could be swayed by certain states out west take for example Wyoming again uh, 21,821 yeah. miles per capita per year driven and that's why why that's why in Wyoming they have multiple vehicles because they drive so many miles because I mean you got to understand they are so spread out I mean I mean we're talking major distances between towns and so if you live if you live in one area, the town probably doesn't have a ton of work. You might have to drive a you know I have to drive 50, 60 miles just to get to work. Um, I know my wife's dad, uh, he drives, let's see, to work. Um, let me think, how far would that be? Oh man, that would probably be mm, he probably drives about 60 miles to work and drives about 60 miles back. So like he drives about 120 miles a day, five days a week to work, uh, you know, roughly, give or take there. And so you add that up with all his other driving and stuff. I mean, he's probably doing he's probably doing that right there every year as well, maybe more. Um, it just depends on where you live at and how wide it is and how uh, far you got to go to work and then drive to the store and all this other stuff by the folks of Wyoming. It is number one in the nation yet again. And this that's about 60 miles a day. So, I mean, this is the state of Wyoming where there are only two escalators in the entire state. They're, they're used to doing things the hard way. <laughs> It's official, there are no two ways about this. American cars, and you can quote me on this, American cars are approximately massive. For once, I don't really have any statistics to back this up, it's just, it's observational fact. In the US, you have chunky SUVs, massive 4x4 trucks, and those big family vans that hold up to 287 children. In Britain, <laughs> you have the hatchback. All that to say that cars are just smaller in the United Kingdom. I mean, most things are, right? The roads are smaller, so we have smaller cars and we have fewer people using them in general. Here, those 4x4 trucks that Marty covets in Back to the Future and eventually gets are fairly common here. You've probably seen them. They're usually owned by people who think they own the roads. It's. If I think, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Ford F-150 maybe it isn't anymore, but forever it was like the uh, best-selling vehicle in the U.S., so, uh, you know, yeah, if, if I, like where I live, like, I mean, I, if I threw a rock in any direction, I'm going to hit a pickup truck. I mean, it's, they're everywhere. I mean, everybody has a pickup. Um, so yeah, they're everywhere, but like, but you know, it's also true that we have a lot of smaller vehicles as well. I mean, we have, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just I think I think in a lot of areas in this country, there's the pickup culture. You know, especially if people live in rural areas, they're hauling stuff all the time, and and a lot of people have a large plots of land, and so they have they have to haul tractors and all sorts of stuff. And that's generally speaking the reason for a lot of them. Um, but other people just like pickups. But um, we also have like a lot of a lot of Hondas and Toyotas here, Honda Accords and things like that. So we have we have a fair share of uh, smaller vehicles as well. Um, yeah. 
If you've ever seen those country roads in the United Kingdom, I think half of American cars wouldn't be able to fit. They'd have to cut through the fields and potentially kill hundreds of cows, you know, bringing it back to South Dakota. Of course, they're less likely to do that if drivers have a better understanding of signage. There's a big difference when it comes to road signs, and that's partly because in Britain we conform largely to European standards, and mm. Americans weirdly don't. I'm being stupid on purpose, just enjoy it. But that's why that's British say. signs around the country are very similar to what you might find in, say, France or Germany and the like, except, you know, without kilometres, we have miles, despite being metric. And our signs are in English, unless you're in Wales, where they're written in consonants and in the united states there is adherence to the manual on uniform traffic control devices this is chiefly federal guidance on road signage but there are some states eight in fact um that go by the use state m-u-t-c-d okay their own state's version of what the signage should be. So depending on the state you're in, the signage could be different. So do look out for that if you're ever moving here, or even if you just live here already and you're traveling to another state. But let's be honest, it's not it's not that complicated. It really isn't that complicated. Uh, you just basically, if you know if you know stop and you know a speed limit sign, what a speed limit sign looks like, and you know how to read the, the numbers on the speed limit sign, and I mean, generally speaking, the other signs that you might see different from state to state really aren't going to be something that's really going to affect your driving that much. I'm sure that may exist on an occasion you might be confused a little bit, but as a whole, I don't think it'll affect most people's driving going from state to state. And then some states, you know who you are, have a combination of both state and federal regulations. That is called sitting on the fence. Now, quick caveat here, when it comes to US and British signage, it's not all entirely different. Take, for example, the stop sign. They're almost identical. Uh, oh. Same with no entry and give way, except in the United States, it's called yield. Oh, I like that, man. So, like, hold on. I want to see those again. Hold on. I mean, the stop sign is obvious. Uh, I figured they would probably be the same. Um... This one, I mean, I would probably be confused on this at first because I, you know, I know what do not enter is. And now that I see it, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's that's obviously a do not enter sign. Um, but at first, you know, I probably would think it was a do not enter sign, but I would be hesitant to understand. So I wouldn't enter it because I wouldn't be sure. So it would do its job because I still wouldn't enter it, even though I wouldn't be 100% sure if it was a do not enter sign. But it makes sense. And give way. Give way. I mean, that that makes sense. Yield, give way, same thing. Uh, and the triangle. That's cool, man. Okay. It's good to know, man. I would understand those signs. Except in the United States, it's called yield. Fine. But what about some of the millions of signs that are completely different? Here's a very, very, very brief sample of some of those that you might come into contact with. So our interchange road signs employ different... Whoa. Okay, I've got to tell you right now. Uh, I'm looking at this sign and I literally, it's like, it's, it's, this, it's so foreign to me that it's no different than if someone asked me to read Chinese. Like, I'm like ring road, a Filton, a third. I am so confused. I mean, obviously this is a road and these are roads off of it. Like, I have no idea what this like little split here is. Stoke Guilford Parkway. Obviously, I know what a parkway is. Like a, I mean, it's like a highway, but it's like, what is it telling me to do here? I mean, is it just? I guess it's just telling me these are coming up, but I'm so confused on what this means. Why is this here? Wait, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really get it. Um, this right here is just this is the interstate you're on, um, or this is the interstate that you're actually sorry. This is the interstate that you're uh, turning off onto. Deegan Express, Amsterdam Avenue, half a mile up on exit 1C. I mean, uh, I'm sure this is this. I'm sure as simple as this is to me, everybody that's from the UK watching this, like, this is a simple to you. But like, I'm like, I'm sure if someone explained it to me, I would understand it. And I'll probably watch a video on this type of stuff at some point because I find it interesting to kind of learn this. I also plan on visiting the UK at some point. So I definitely want to, uh, you know, learn these in case I decide to drive somewhere. Uh, I don't know if I will or not, uh, but I think I'd enjoy the experience. So anyway, let's continue. 
colors and just different markings in general uh, no parking signs this is very important take a look they are quite okay. different in color and yeah this uh i would know it meant no something but i would have no idea what it was telling me not to do necessarily if i just saw this sign obviously here no parking to me is pretty self-explanatory in just appearance in general this is your speed limit right here compared wow, to the united states and not only do train crossing signs differ from country to country but in the united states they usually use the word railroad yeah. crossing and the sign looks like this wow, and as somebody who doesn't drive the no pedestrian signs are the ones i look out for and they are quite markedly different there are some funny ones too tanks allowed uh, that's true in both the united kingdom in parts of the united kingdom <laughs> and crossing man Basically, I don't know if I've ever seen that sign. That's so that's so cool, man. There's an absolute plethora of signage differences. I only scratched the surface there, but getting all of them into this video would have been an uphill struggle. I only said that so I could get that sign in there. And actually, while we're on the subject of wordplay, that brings us on to our final entry. There are a staggering number of terminological differences to do with automobiles between the United States and the United Kingdom. This is partially because, of course, both countries devise their rules and regulations around the roads independently of each other. But, and this is by no means an exhaust, <laughs> If list. Here are the key differences. All right, in British English, you have bonnet. In American English, you have hood. You have boot instead of truck. I knew this one, but bonnet is the hood. Okay. Interesting. Trunk, bumper instead of also yeah the this is an interesting one uh bumper on a what what i would describe as a bumper is the very front or the very back of the car it's got the you know the the piece that's kind of sticks out that would literally if you hit something from the back of the front it would bump it right the fender i wouldn't call that the fender that's just the bumper the fender is the it's the the piece of metal that is kind of above the tire, so to speak. It's kind of like if you under, if you can picture that, it's like you know, it's like it's almost like the 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 like hole that you see the tire in. It's like that is cut out of the fender. The fender is the where the tire is. It's like kind of the fender well, so to speak. So um, I think that may be slightly different from how we uh, what you know, how you guys would describe that. I don't know what you guys would describe what I would describe as the fender. Cause I don't think we're talking the same thing. I think we're, I think the bumper is, I think we have that the same, but I think the fender may be slightly different on what you would describe that piece anyway. Bumper, but maybe sometimes fender car park instead of parking lot, central reserve instead of median central reserve. It's the, Oh, okay. So, so the the middle middle between is that like the middle between two roads would be the central reserve crossroads instead of four way okay. stop curve instead of bend driving hmm. license instead of driver's license dual carriageway instead of divided dual carriageway that's interesting hmm huh okay. Highway or freeway, gear stick instead of gear shift or shifter, give way instead of yield, indicator instead of turn signal mm -hmm. or blinker, lorry or truck, whereas in the US it's usually just truck. Lorry? Never heard that. What does this mean? Does this have a, a specific meaning other than truck? Like, like, where did this come from? Was this like what truck was originally called in the UK? Or is, is this kind of describing more than a truck? Because I've never heard the word lorry before. I mean, obviously, I've heard the name law. Wait. Yeah, I have heard lorry. Yeah, but it's L-O-R-I. I've actually known someone named lorry. Um, but obviously, that's a different word. The generalized British term motorway can highway? encompass anything from expressway to highway to interstate to freeway. You've got motorway services area oh. or simply services, which are... Oh, so like you call all those... They're they're all motorways. Whether it's a high okay in the U.S., we definitely they're they're uh, they're separated. Generally speaking, a highway is a wide lane road that travels within a state, and an interstate is well is a very wide lane road 
fast, the fastest type of road, generally speaking, that will travel between states. Uh, you know, an expressway, I'm sure you can you get what an expressway probably is. And what was the other one he said? I don't know. Where'd it go? Oh, yeah, rest area, rest stop for interesting motorway services. I mean, same thing. It makes sense. It's just interesting how we... Uh, have different words for it. United States to rest area or rest stop or travel plaza. Travel plaza. You know, pavement versus sidewalk. Well, to, to travel pla Okay. The rest area and rest stop are the same thing. It's a place along an interstate that, uh, and I guess would be along a motorway to, to you guys. Uh, they basically, usually they have uh, bathrooms. Um, they have... Um, Usually, like vending machines, where you can, you know, you can get a snack. Uh, sometimes they have like coffee vending machines, or you know, soft drinks and other types of snacks. Uh, usually, they have like a little park area with some park benches where you can go sit down and have lunch. If you brought your, if you brought lunch with you while you're driving, uh, most people use them when you are kind of, you know, you're going long distances on the interstate. Maybe you're traveling across many states or whatever, and uh, you know, you need to stop. To, for different reasons, obviously, um, but a rest stop or travel travel pl plazas are a little different. Travel plazas are mostly mostly used by uh, truckers, um, but everybody else uses them as well. But mainly, they're known for places where truckers stop, and usually they'll have uh, you know they'll have rest actual restaurants in there, and they'll have showers for truckers and things like that. But everybody uses them. But uh, they're just they're great places if you're a uh, cross-country driver to be able to uh, stop and uh, clean up and, you know, eat at a restaurant where you can park a big truck and things like fill up with diesel and all that other stuff. Plaza, you have pavement versus sidewalk. Wait, pavement? So the thing, sidewalk, the thing on the side of the road, that's, you would call that a pavement? That Pavement here would simply be what the road is made of. The road is made of pavement. You know what I mean? That's interesting, which is technically made of asphalt, usually, unless it's concrete. Uh, but uh, that's interesting. I guess the sidewalks, a lot of times, well, sidewalks aren't always made of pavement. They're sometimes, or anyway, yeah, I'm confusing myself, but <laughs> that's interesting. Pavement. Okay. Petrol cap Mason. versus gas cap. Petrol station versus gas okay, station. Mason. Roundabout versus also roundabout, but maybe rotary or traffic circle. I've never heard it called rotary. If I saw rotary, I thought that's something you guys in the UK would probably use. I've never heard anyone use the word rotary. Uh, roundabout, definitely. Traffic circle is actually more popular. But, uh, you know, I think you guys have a lot more of those than we do here in America. I Honestly, I can't remember the last time I went around a traffic circle. I don't I don't think we think. Yeah, I don't I don't think we have any where I live. I don't think we have any. I don't think I've seen. I've been here for Wait, let me think. Ugh. Yeah, I, I've been I've been here for a few years now. You know, we moved away from my home state and uh, came to uh, the state where my my wife's family is at, and uh, so she could be closer to her mom and stuff like that for a while because she had been away for so long. Um, and uh, since I've been here, I don't think I've seen one traffic circle or roundabout. I don't think I've seen one. <laughs> and uh, if I think back growing up, I think I saw a couple of them my entire life. Um, it's just I, I don't think they're very popular here uh, for some reason. I've I've actually learned a little bit about them, and I, I actually think they're pretty, pretty ingenious. I think they really do help traffic flow better. So uh, it could be something that uh, a lot of areas in America might want to think about adding to some some different areas on some roads. Uh, that may have traffic issues. I think it could improve uh, the traffic flow. You have windscreen instead of windshield and zebra crossing instead. Zebra crossing? Okay, I, I guess it's the animal. I would call it a zebra. He calls it a zebra. I guess that's what he's... Crosswalk versus zebra. I, I don't understand this one. I mean, I understand it's, it's, you know, you're crossing, but... Where does the zebra come from? Like, why? why? I, I just, I would never guess zebra crossing. Where does that come from? Please, someone let me know in the comments where, why a cross, why what we consider a crosswalk is considered a zebra crossing. Instead of crosswalk. 
And with that, we've hit the red light on this video. That's uh, That was a reference to the stoplight on traffic lights, not not the dodgy area of Amsterdam. Uh, there's plenty more to say on this subject, and I dare say I will do so in the future. Meanwhile, let me know in the comments what your favorite difference is, or what stumbled you most while driving in the other country. It All right, guys, I thought that was really good. Uh, I learned quite a bit, uh, actually, and um, I thought he did a good job considering he uh, has never drove, really, never been never been a licensed driver. I thought he did a pretty good job on uh, putting together this little list here. Um, and uh, definitely learned quite a few things. Um, you know, you know something I was just thinking about when he was talking about red light. Do you guys actually, do you call it a stoplight or a red light? Uh, and like, do you, do you call a green light a green light or do you call it something else like go light or something like that? Uh, I was just thinking, what do I call it? You know, how you, you might have words for something, but you can't really think of what you really call it. I think I call a... Stoplight, I think I call it a stoplight, uh, but a green light, I think I just call it a green light. Um, but that'd be interesting to know, is there another word for that in the UK? Um, but guys, I thought this was really interesting. And uh, my goodness, man, I, I really want to look at this deeper. I, I really enjoyed this and uh, it's so fascinating the differences we have in the two countries and, you know, and the signs and things like that. Uh, where was that? You know, I already knew that we were probably going to drive more miles because you have guys have better public transportation as a whole, probably not in every area, but as a whole. And, you know, it's just a smaller country. So you don't necessarily probably have to drive as much to get around from place to place. I'm guessing um, as a lot of areas. I mean, if you go in the middle of this country, man, I mean, I mean, there's some places that you might live in a town that could be over 100 miles from the next town. I mean, I mean, obviously, that's not the norm, but like I'm, it just goes to show like there is massive amount of miles that some people have to travel. And so it just makes sense that you're going to have to um, travel uh, a lot more in this country sometimes if in some areas than you would in uh, smaller countries. Uh, but obviously, I knew some of this, uh, but uh where was it, man? Where was that at? Road signs. Uh, I can't see where it is. It doesn't matter. But uh, yeah, man, I've got to figure that out. Uh, that right there is insane to me. Now, I know it's not insane. I know it makes sense once you know what you're looking at. But it's just so different. I mean... I mean, down to like, I guess, is the M32 and M4 and M30, A432, I guess these are roads or highways or something. Uh, Ring Road, I, I guess that's what this is. And it's like, what's the break here? I, I don't know. I am so confused on that. Uh, you know, it's just, it's one of those things I've never seen before. I've never seen any type of, I, I've never seen any type of road sign that looked like this and has this type of verb or like, I don't know. Anyway doesn't matter i'll figure it out we'll uh you know definitely plan on looking at some more driving videos uh speaking of if you've got any you know interesting driving videos that you you think uh would help me uh learn some things about driving in the uk or ireland please let me know feel free to drop them in the comments if i see them i definitely will bookmark them and uh you know try to get to them at some point uh, but anyways, guys, thank you so much for stopping by. Please click that like button. Feel free to drop your comments or suggestions about this video or others. And don't forget to subscribe to continue to follow me on my journey to discover my British and Irish ancestry. Until next time, guys. Peace.